look at the interface between nutrition and resilience. So we know that we are facing the so triple burden of malnutrition. First burden is undernourishment. We still have 800 million people who are suffering from lack of um, uh, calories. So simply not enough to eat to their stomach you know, is empty. The second uh, burden is hidden hunger. Hidden hunger means lack of micronutrients, vitamins in their diet. And a hidden hunger is equally damaging as a visible hunger. So every year we lose 2%, 3% of global GDP because of hidden hunger. The third burden is emerging, that is overnutrition and obesity. It's particularly true in many of the emerging economies, including my, my own country, China. So we were, we were hungry, we were undernourished, but today we eat too much. The obesity, overweight, have emerged as a heavy burden to the whole society, not only in terms of health, not, on, not only in terms of uh, the, the social cost, but also uh, in terms of sustainability. So you're simply eating too much. If everybody follows Chinese, Chinese diet pattern, which follow the US diet pattern, simply this world is not sustainable. It's a triple burden. So all this contribute heavy, heavy loss of uh, our economic um, its opportunities. So not only GDP, every year we lose about, you know, and latest figure actually is 5 or 7% of total GDP loss from the triple burden. But also, more important, is our future generation, our children. So they are either undernourished or over, over nourished. And that, that affects their mental health, that affects their physical health. So the damage is permanent. We call it a life, life sentence. So nutrition and resilience are intermittent. So nutrition is both an input to an outcome of strengthening resilience. And reducing malnutrition is crucial for strengthening resilience. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. So well-nourished households can better withstand shocks. So when the people are strong, well-nourished, when the crisis can, and they are very resilient either to cope with it or to recover, even prosper after the crisis. Strengthening resilience is key for reducing malnutrition. So households affected the most are uh, most affected by shocks face higher, higher risk of malnutrition. We know that from our studies in Africa, <laughs> in South Asia. We have enough opportunities to, to strengthen that link. Yes, we know all these challenges. So if people is undernourished, they are not resilient. If, they, if the people are not resilient or the system is not resilient, and it will cause malnutrition. So opportunity to strengthen that mix. One is to accelerate investment in nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive intervention. I will come back. I will come back uh, to that issue in the next slide. Adopt a value chain approaches for improving nutrition. So integrating nutrition into the whole value chain. So it's not just a consumption. We must start from the very beginning, production side, what seeds we select, to what farm farming practices we choose to harvesting, transportation, processing, and the final consumption. And to produce more nutrition with more efficient use of all inputs on a durable basis. So here I will call it so-called sustainable intensification, which means produce more with less. More means more nutrition. Less, less water, less land, less energy, and definitely less carbon emission. By the way, so CGI is using this uh, as, a, as a strategic cross-cutting thing to guide its research. By the way, I should also acknowledge Shen Shemus. Shemus here, and he was very much involved in CGI reform. I think you take the credit, and we take the, the blame. And he hired most, he helped us to hire most of the CEOs or chief executives of the new CGI system. So good or bad, you take the credit. <laughs> so the CGI is using that as a strategic thing to guide its future research. Then promote multi-sector, multi-discipline, multi-actor approaches. So working in silence simply is not acceptable anymore. We, and this has been preached for so many years. One of the questions is how can we really integrate it into our day-to-day -day work? We just had a big conference in New Delhi 
to look at an in, intersector approach, cross-sector approach to tackle malnutrition issues uh, for children. Um, so not only Ministry of Health, not only Ministry of Agriculture, not only Ministry of Development and Women's Development, everybody must work together. So it's not just a, um, the preach or a rhetoric. We must integrate that into our day-to-day work. And finally, improve the status of rural women. The women is so critical for achieving nutrition outcome. So they, they are involved in producing food. You might be surprised. Big part, big share of the food actually is produced by women, particularly in Africa, in South Asia. And they also cook, cook the food for the family. And so if they are empowered with knowledge information about the nutrition, and most likely, and they will feed their children much better, nutritiously, healthily. So this diagram shows how we can really invest in nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive interventions. So nutrition is final outcome. Um, nutrition-specific interventions probably means okay, micronutrient supplement. So you can fortify your rice, your wheat maize by adding iron, zinc, iron into your food, <coughs> into your salt. Then breastfeeding and uh, uh, complement feeding. We have knowledge to show that the first 1,000 days is so critical. I really appreciate the concerns work in, in this area to work together to push 1,000 days initiative. Focus on nutrition of the children under 1,000 days. So between, <coughs> um, between conception and uh, two years' birthday. So, so critical there. So once damage is done, the damage will be permanent. So you will not be able to fix it later on. Then dietary diversification. So not just rice, wheat, corn, maize, you have enough to eat, but more important, it's quality of the diet. Then nutrition sensitive program and approaches. How can we really reshape agriculture for achieving nutrition and health outcome? Make sure that ministers of agriculture are accountable for nutrition outcome. Then social safety net. Yes, many poor and hungry people need to have access to food in short run. We need to bring food to them. But the good question is how can we also bring them out of poverty, hunger in long term? I think during the night we debated how can we make sure that the trade marketing working for the poor so they are out of the graduate from the poverty trap. The women's empowerment I have already mentioned, health, water and sanitation services. Food only accounts for probably 30 to 40 percent of the problem challenges of undernourishment. Sanita- sanitation is another 30 percent. Women's status, another 30 percent. So one third, one third, one third from women's empowerment to food and sanitation. Now, just to give you one example um, so called nutrition sensitive intervention, biofortification. So how can we integrate or add nutrition into food crops like uh, sweet potato, rice, beans, um, wheat, many sorghum, millet? So we can add nutrition into this crop through through breeding. You don't need it to go through GMO. The GM, GMO could be more efficient, faster. But even traditional breeding can add nutrition there. We know that many poor, hungry people will continue to eat rice, wheat, and beans, particularly in South Asia. How can we help them to improve nutrition, even though they continue to eat rice, wheat, and maize? This is our like rain. So we, we are not in agriculture for improved nutrition. I have, to say that I have to say the NGOs, the World Concern, the Hanan Kala International, have been in the frontier to link agriculture to nutrition and health, have been in the frontier to look at a resilient, resilient before anybody. CGIR, if we need to learn from them, and we have a job to do to synthesize best practices, good work you have done, and to scale them up, to influence policy. So not just the NGO doing the work here and there, but more important, integrate that into, into our day-to-day policy making. So, here, focus addressing multi sector causes of malnutrition. So, water, women's status, agriculture, all this matter. Now, learning how to effectively address challenges of multi sector collaboration. So, actually, quite interesting that gender not only, not only involves women, 
but also involves <coughs> men. So until men realize how important the woman is, so the impact will be very small. And finally, this one is quite interesting. District Coordination of Nutrition Committee. India is learning from that. India, in some states, they set up this called Nutrition Commission in Maharashtra. Three years ago, they set up that commission, bring different sectors together, and we have seen some impact there already. A system is so important, a resilient system. So, you know, we, we used to work in silos, but today the system is a must. Even one note in the system fails, the whole system fails. Just like an aircraft, that's a triple or seven aircraft, right? What they do is to reduce, uh, uh, um, let's say, to build more re re redundancy in the system. Three or four, it's a default system. One fails, another one kicks in. But there is also efficiency involved. So too much redundancy, you lose, lose efficiency. So the balance between efficiency and resilience is very critical. Now the question is, how can you really target the weakest nodes to make sure that the whole system is not going to collapse because of that weak node? And to optimize our resource allocation, not maximization. Maximization is too costly. Optimization, optimize the resource allocation to make sure that the weakest nodes will not cause the collapse of the whole system. And capacity building, obviously, here is very critical, right? You already mentioned. Capacity building of the community, of the individuals, particularly individuals. We have to observe if the individuals are, are, are nourished, well nourished, and they are very resilient. You know, otherwise, you know, the resilient system should also focus on the nutrition of the individuals. In conclusion, the eliminating hunger and malnutrition really needs high priority post 2015 agenda we have already mentioned. Make sure that this is a key. People focus, we focus on people. Make sure that people can move out of malnutrition and hunger. And then resilience is critical in doing that. So resilience must integrate into the 17 goals right now, 169 targets. We can debate about this 17 goals, too many, some are instruments, some are truly goals. And 169 targets, they have to be measurable, they have to be achievable, but also ambitious at the same time. So let's all work together. The post-2015 agenda, mainstream, mainstream resilience into all this. Until the system is stable, until the people um, move out of poverty hunger permanently, then our system will always be very vulnerable to shocks. Then ICM2. ICM2, we have very high hope. I really hope that the different stakeholders, the governments all work together. Let's commit to certain principles, to certain goals, then we can always work together at the country level to develop country compact roadways, uh, roadmap to achieve certain goals uh, we commit to uh, this week. My final point, this is final. Knowledge, data, and accountability are key for supporting country level strategies. So how can we really learn from each other? Connect the data, make sure that the governments are accountable to certain indicators, we have all agreed, <coughs> we have all committed. So, IPRI is willing to work with Irish Aid, with the concern, with many other stakeholders here to push for that idea. How can we set up a knowledge hub to support the follow ups of the ICN2? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.